Hello, welcome back. Um, this session is on innovation in the workspace, um, which of course reaches across property, digital technology, working practices, staff management. It's one of those really integrated agendas with a huge amount of potential, but the complexity uh, which well, requires innovation to make it work. Um, again, we have, um, we have four panellists this time, each will be doing five minutes, then questions. We'll start with Martin Seller, who's the Programmes Director and the SRO for Government Property Agency, UK. Um, Katlin Alvela, uh, Director General of the Estonian Emergency Response Centre. Sujay Bhattacharya um, is the Director and Global Practice Head for, of Workspace Services for Wipro. Um, and then Mark Gray, Director of Digital Transformation, uh, Crown Prosecution Service, UK. And we'll start with Martin. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm Martin Seller. I'm uh, Programme Director at the Government Property Agency. Um, I'm also SRO for something called the uh, Smarter Working uh, Programme, uh, which means that I sort of lead on Smarter Working and its rollout for uh, staff in the UK government um, and um, just want to say a bit about what smarter working is and what, how that links to, to workspace. So um, smarter working is about a choice for staff about how and where they work. So everyone in this room, it's about you feeling you've got full choice about how and where you work um, and I hope that's the case for you. Um, so what is smarter working? Um, it's a combination of uh, people, technology, and, uh, and workplace. So on the people side, um, it's around uh, managers feeling uh, able and equipped to manage by outcomes, uh, to support people uh, to work where um, and how they want, uh, and for the leadership of organizations to really embrace that and say, yep, we, we are we're not expecting uh, people to be in the office five days a week uh, would be a good way of thinking about on the people side why culturally uh, it's quite a big thing. The second area is technology and this has been you know a huge area but you can imagine the technology and aspects to smarter working be it collaboration tools, smartphones and uh, laptops, more about that later and then the workplace um, obviously that might be at home but if, if you're in the office um, it's about having alternative places to work in, in 2019 and not just a traditional office. Um, so what I was going to do is just give you a bit of a timeline of how the UK government uh, is doing um, in this space uh, in the time that I've got. So you won't be able to see the words below, but hopefully you can see the decades. And I'm just going to quickly talk about each of those decades and how it felt. I mean, I, I joined the civil service in the 1990s, so I'm allowed to start there. Um, so in the 1990s, uh, for the UK civil service, uh, technology was incredibly limited, if you had any at all. Uh, workstations uh, that were tied to a desk were rolled out in the 90s. I remember getting my first one. Uh, the workplace, there were a lot of offices, but there was a bit of open plan. And for the people, uh, there was an expectation you were in the office five days a week. If you roll that forward to uh, the next decade, the noughties, the technology changed. Uh, people in headquarters operations uh, started to get um, some uh, mobiles, a few laptops. Blackberries came in around 2008, but they were mainly for headquarters staff. They weren't something that was right across uh, the organizations. Uh, the workplace started to go open plan, uh, but desking was all one-to-one. -one. So you would have your own desk. You would know when you came in the morning where you were going to sit. Um, and people were still expected to come to the office uh, five days a week. Um, and um, there were some home workers and there was a difference. But if you roll forward to the current decade, the technology has exploded. Uh, as the decade's gone on, more and more people have got smartphones and they've got laptops and they've got real choice about how they work that they didn't have before. Uh, the workplace is now virtually all open plan. Uh, and there's breakout space within there, and there's alternative work positions for people. And you no longer, in most offices, now got one-to-one -one desking. That's quite rare. Most people, they've moved to at least eight to 10, so eight desks for every 10 people. And often now it's six to 10, so six desks for every 10 people, uh, because people have got choice. Now, 
it's different in every organization, in every office, but more and more uh, people have got choice. And why up there on the slide does it say July 2018 was it significant? Well, smarter working became government policy, um, which meant that by 2022, every civil servant will have the choice to work in a way that makes sense for them. And by 2020, all government departments will need to, 70% of government departments will need to meet that smarter working standard. So the last bit of the slide there talks about 2019 and beyond and the innovations that are ahead. Um, it's inevitable, I think, that what is happening is offices are going to become more and more places for team building rather than somewhere you go every day. Uh, we still have got pockets within the civil service who work in the offices Mondays to Thursdays and work from home on a Friday, but it is changing every year, every month. Uh, and I think, you know, my proposition for the debate we're going to have today is where will we be in 2030? I've talked about uh, six deaths for every 10 people. I do think it's unreasonable to think within the civil service we might move to one, off, one desk for every five people, something like that, in a few, a few years' time, because people are embracing this and they love it. We're doing it because, you know, people are very engaged with smarter working and they get a lot out of it. And, you know, that's why we're, we're taking it forward as government policy. Okay. Kathleen. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to give you a brief uh, overview how we use technology to save lives in Estonia. If you come to Estonia and uh, something happens and you need help, you call 112 and our call takers uh, will uh, take uh, uh, immediately your call and uh, will uh, ask some questions to understand what happened and where happened. And uh, sometimes uh, there is no emergency case and uh, then call taker just uh, gives uh, maybe some recommendation, answers your questions, and, uh, and uh, so it goes uh, one million times per year. So we reach one million calls uh, per, uh, per year. Uh, in Estonia uh, is 1.2 million inhabitants, that means uh, that uh, every person uh, once calls to our emergency center. But anyway, half of the uh, cases, half of the calls, uh, uh, that means uh, uh, half of a million times we need to send out uh, police, rescue uh, or ambulance. And um, this is the, the most or the biggest difference between Estonia and uh, most of other European countries that uh, our call takers, uh, takers understand that uh, some uh, emergency cases happened. And uh, then uh, she um, adds all this information to our um, uh, IT system. And uh, when she saves this inter information, this goes to the next desk and uh, dispatchers are working in the same room. And that means that uh, police or, or rescue or ambulance, they don't have no dispatchers, no call takers, no control rooms at all. So there are no other parallel systems uh, as it in uh, most of uh, European countries. And uh, uh, to be uh, to do this uh, work uh, fast and, and be professional and, and uh, and send the resources uh, out um, uh, quickly. Uh, we have uh, de developed an uh, information system where our call takers uh, put all the information, they save it, and it goes to the next desk where is dispatcher. Call takers uh, stays with you, asks another question, other question, clarifying all the situation. And uh, the ladies or gentlemen sitting in the next desk, they are already uh, looking uh, for the uh, right uh, resource which is needed in place. And uh, actually all the information put in the uh, IT system, this is also uh, available in uh, police cars, in rescue teams, in ambulance cars. So all the information our call takers are gathering, this is available for uh, the um, guys who are driving on the scene. And um, we also uh, use this GIS 112 map 
this map has uh, several layers uh, our call takers can use. And uh, maybe the most um, useful is, is this just for um, uh, our um, dispatchers, because they see all the available resources all over the Estonia. They see where is police car, where is rescue teams, where is ambulance, who is available, who is occupied right now. And if there is uh, maybe some big accident happened, they can uh, say that, OK, stop here and move fastly in, uh, to another place. So, uh, and they, uh, they can find the, 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 the best way or the fastest way to the scene and so on. Also, we use uh, uh, AML. Uh, that means all uh, people uh, uh, who is calling us by, by Android phone or iPhones, uh, exactly uh, we will see on the map uh, where you are located. Uh, that means uh, we can see approximately 5 to 10 meters uh, where you are. If you are coming uh, to Estonia, you don't know uh, the, the street name or the building name or the forest, where are you? So we can find uh, where you are and we can send uh, directly um, uh, and police or rescue uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the right place. And uh, since the last year, we are able also to take e-calls. That means all the new uh, car models in Europe uh, since the last year. Uh, uh, this must be have this uh, e-call device in the cars. And if a uh, car accident is happening, then we are able to take uh, the call uh, from the car. So um, uh, last year, uh, so it, it started in April last year, so it's not even 12 months. But during this time, we have had uh, three uh, calls from cars. And uh, if uh, you ask, uh, is three, two, or uh, two, it's, it's enough, or, or, it, or this IT system uh, launching this was too expensive to save just three lives, then we say that if we have already saved only one life, then we are success, successful because um, the human life is uh, priceless. Uh, these were the uh, things we are uh, using right now, but uh, here are just a couple of examples uh, which are just on the table right now. Um, uh, Everybody is using uh, um, cell phone, uh, taking photos, taking videos, texting, so on. So we thought that we should be uh, ready uh, uh, to uh, receive uh, your video calls also, because um, from in, in some cases, for example, domestic violence cases, uh, the victim or, or the witness can't talk, but uh, <coughs> she can put uh, the, the phone uh, just uh, uh, filming or uh, recording, and then we should have this um, uh, live stream. And also, uh, maybe there is some heart attack, and, and people need wants to give the first aid, uh, then we can give recommendations and, and so on. So we hope that in the end of this year or, or the beginning of next year, we will be able to get this, uh, video calls, these video calls also. And the next step is going to be, we would like to be able to send these uh, uh, pictures and these videos exactly with directly to the uh, police uh, and rescue and ambulance cars, so the, the teams which will come to help you, they already uh, can see what is happening right now. Uh, early warning system, uh, this were also um, uh, working on this uh, right now. So if you are located in a in, in certain place or the certain area or, or your uh, house or building or car located in this area and there is maybe coming um, a snowstorm or floating or something, then we can send you directly the recommendations, information, what you should do, uh, move or not to move. Uh, and, uh, and also we are working on crisis hotline information uh, line which daily basis uh, works as an informational line next to the 112. 112 is emergency line and, and, uh, and the other uh, line is uh, just information. You, you need uh, some questions, some um, information from government and if there is a crisis then it turns crisis hotline uh, uh, informational number. And this communication we hope we start to do in, in our society in the beginning of next year. And of course we have lots of uh, other uh, brilliant ideas uh, which we are just uh, testing and, and launching one, one day. So thank you. Thank you. CJ? <laughs> CJ from WebPro. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. No, good afternoon, everyone. Let's try that again, please. <laughs> Perfect. So we are up. 
All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the next five minutes um, essentially talk about five or six big mistakes that you know, we have seen people make or, or organizations make in terms of defining what that workplace is. So number one, a lot of times there's a lot of confusion in terms of thinking that a user interface or just digitizing an aspect of a user experience should translate into a good user experience. And that's never the case. Think of that of the tomato ketchup, right? The bottle is always upside down for the right user experience. So just one aspect of digital doesn't necessarily mean user experience. So always spend time in identifying what that customer journey is, understanding you know, what that customer is. We always call it user experience. Think of them as your customer. Identify what their journey is and then define or design the workspace. Right? Uh, Martin mentioned one of the customers came back and said his biggest KPI for him uh, annually is the number of uh, real estate space that he reduces year on year. Right? No IT metric. So that's where the world is moving in the workspace services. Now think of the challenges that hit us. Right? Uh, when you're defining or designing the workplace services, uh, you know, we would like to think of it as four pillars. One is an available world because it's always a journey of moving from what they experience in their personal world, moving to an enterprise or to a citizen experience, is designed for a zero disruption, designed for a continuum of service, which means essentially every user will have six to seven devices through which it will get their services rendered. Third is designed for the right assisted service, so that's the right use of AI, cognitive intelligence, bots, so on and so forth. And the fourth is how does that customer even engage. So that's the part where you consumerize or digitize the experience of getting that service. So let's talk about the available service. You know, a lot of times we've seen really the biggest challenge uh, is to provide the education to every single person around and the right way to maybe containerize or move applications outside of a device conversation so that people can access that information from anywhere, any device, and any time available. So design or the services that are always available through the right mix of using the right cloud option or the right virtualization option. And that's what we have seen really, really work well. Also define or design the services that you need to proactively understand, monitor, and then ensure that things get resolved before they happen in reality. And you know, we had some very interesting experiences coming in. So, uh, you know, George mentioned right in the morning about the different user personas. Every user has their own persona, and you would want to define what that solution means and what that availability means for that user. So define the right user personas within that service that you're trying to give, and then define the right technology that backs it up. The connected world, this is interesting. Uh, today, uh, again, Martin, to your point, uh, there was a mention in terms of uh, by 2022, you would want to have smart workers for the government wherein they would get to work where they want to, but that does not take away the age-old need of collaboration. So collaboration need no longer be physical. It can, of course, transcend in terms of the geographic boundaries, timelines, as well as devices. Uh, you know, it's, it's already matured in the en ent enterprise world where there's more restrictions or, or the more control. However, in the government sector, I'm sure the collaboration piece will be something that will come up big in terms of cutting across these different technologies. So a connected world experience is a must wherein you do not have to put any restrictions on your users to either collaborate or talk to each other. Data is going to be big. Right? The government will have so many different third-party vendors that you would want to share the files or, or restricted data with. So getting the right security and moving the data across, uh, making the data ubiquitous is, is going to be critical uh, when you design the workplace for the future. And the last piece is uh, you know, designing the right AI. Uh, you know, we, we, we all have read about how AI can really destroy certain user experience. And, and, and of course, like every other technology, the way you use it is going to be very, very critical. In the workspace services, defining or designing the right AI and NLP is, is key. Uh, one of our customers, uh, you know, you, you would never think of linguistics, but a lot of times now in the workspace services, the most important person in the AI space is a linguistic person. Because every person who asks a question of how you resolve a particular issue is very, very different. So the linguistics is going to be important. 
And, and we will now slowly move away from a device experience to more of an enterprise or the government or the user experience uh, by moving into IoT. There will be 7.5 billion IoT devices that will hit a user experience. And if you don't look at that, you will actually miss the entire purpose. So I would just, you know, just time's up for me. But the last piece that I would like to uh, leave you guys back with is think of any services that you do in terms of creating the right platform. It's about the end-to-end -end service orchestration and the automation so that the users don't only totally get the good first course, but it's think of, think of user experience like a good dinner with your wife, uh, which is paradoxical at times, but uh, think of it as a good dinner with your wife wherein you have to have the first course good, but the desert also needs to be nice throughout the way. So think of it as a platform for an end-to-end -end experience. Thank you. And Mark, <coughs> Director of Digital Transformation for the Crown Prosecution Service. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'm Mark. I look after the technology and actually also the property for the uh, CPS. So uh, for those of you who are overseas with us today, uh, what does the CPS do? We are the public prosecutor uh, within the UK. Uh, and so you, you can kind of think of our service as a bit like a workflow. So we, we receive evidence that the police have gathered about a prospective case. Uh, we decide whether there is enough evidence to charge that case. And then we, if there is, we pursue that case through to the prosecution and, and passing that material out to the, to the court system. Um, and so I guess the, if I touch first on the kind of journey that we have been on as an organization over the last five years, um, and in terms of digital innovation, essentially that core workflow that I've just described has moved from being entirely paper-based to entirely digital-based. Um, and that's happened, as I say, over a relatively short period of time. And that, as the slide behind me sort of demonstrates, that, that applies to everything that we do. So the exchange of material with the police and with the court service and with the defence and with the judiciary is all digital. The presentation in court is all digital. The, the uh, what's called the service of material, i.e. when we're kind of uh, sharing what our case is, is all digital. And so that's a, that's a kind of comprehensive overhaul of the operating model in a, in a relatively short space of time. Um, uh, let's do a bit of audience participation. Um, in 2015, how many pieces of paper do you think the CPS printed in that year? Let's have a, let's have a, somebody shout out, I guess. A million? Yeah. Five million? Eight million? Twenty million? Uh, Fifty million was that? Um, so uh, keep going. Uh, the, the answer is that we printed just over 200 million sheets of paper in 2015. So when I talk about the workflow being a paper-based workflow, um, 200 million sheets worth of paper, that number has come down by about 85% already. Um, there, so, so we're somewhere in the kind of 30 million range. The remaining... Um, you know, I guess the last bastion of, uh, of paper, if you like, in the UK criminal justice system is, uh, is if you are a juror, uh, you still get your, your kind of papers uh, physically. So we're working on that with our court service colleagues now. Um, but obviously that, uh, that transformation away from paper and indeed away from physical uh, disks towards digital portals has had a massive impact on the lives of our colleagues as well. And it, it's essentially enabled them to, uh, to work flexibly in exactly the way that, uh, you know, that Martin and the guys have, were describing. Um, so uh, six years ago, the first laptops were handed out to CPS colleagues. So before that, nobody could work uh, flexibly to any material degree. Uh, now, we are in a space where 91% of our colleagues uh, work remotely every quarter. Um, and the, you know, the remaining 9% are mainly people whose, you know, whose role is necessarily office-based, you know, the, the receptionist, uh, the post room person. Um, and so, you know, we, I don't think we've done that through any whizzy tools. You know, there's nothing on the screen behind me that, uh, that is like, oh my gosh, what an amazing innovation in, uh, in flexible working. It's, it's all about remote access connectivity, cloud-based platforms, WebEx, video conferencing, all, all these things. There's, there's nothing kind of, uh, there's nothing earth shattering from a technology perspective. Um, but what that has done is, you know, it's that change in the core kind of workflow coupled with, uh, you know, I was in the uh, listening to the previous session 
question about that kind of open appetite to, to change that the organization has demonstrated that's enabled our, our people's lives to be, uh, you know, to be completely changed in that respect. As the, the right-hand side of the slide behind me demonstrates, there, there's plenty more to go, actually, in the, in the technology space and plenty more um, things that probably many of your organizations have got. Um, but what I think we have done is, is really um, you know, kind of radically shifted the ways of working um, of the organization. And I've got a final slide that talks about some of the, some of the benefits of that. So um, financially, we CPS have saved 20 million in our property costs. Uh, the taxpayer has actually saved considerably more than that because we've consolidated uh, properties into other, uh, other government departments, into government hubs. Um, and so the CPS might not have saved much money, but the, you know, the public purse as a whole has. Organizationally, massive kind of um, transformation. It's also, you know, it's solved a lot of our recruitment challenges. So, uh, with apologies to those of you who may not know the UK geography very well, uh, CPS Southeast uh, has four bases today. They are Brighton in the southeast, Guildford in the southeast, Canterbury in the southeast, and Newcastle, which is 200 miles away. Um, and that, again, that's the sort of thing that is just, you can imagine the, the, the market for, uh, the job market for lawyers in London and the southeast, pretty competitive, really difficult to hire people. There is, there is a greater availability of, uh, of talented people in the northeast. And so actually, that team is now, is now geographically split and works as kind of a, a coherent whole, but in, uh, you know, with, a, with a significant geographic divide. We've got four or five of those different kind of localized teams. So, so it's not just kind of flexible working on an individual basis, it's also actually on, a, on an organizational basis. You can see some of the kind of, um, you know, the benefits that we're seeing coming through in our kind of staff engagement surveys and so on there. Um, we, we genuinely believe it's, um, it's also future-proofing our organization for, for some of the changes ahead in criminal justice. So, you know, we expect the courts uh, opening hours to extend, of course, that means that we need people who are more flexible. Flexible working absolutely um, enables that. And, and one final comment, I've ju just sort of uh, touched on challenges in the bottom right corner. And I, I think the hardest part of this has been the cultural journey, and particularly what I've called their managerial confidence. So there was absolutely what was described earlier of that kind of, oh my gosh, if, the, if, if my uh, direct report is not somewhere that I can see them, um, then they're probably not working, um, or you know they, they've, they've popped off for a, for a coffee when they should be uh, when they should be reviewing this case. That we, we've we've really changed, worked hard at that culture, changed that culture to enable this kind of flexible working. That's been a lot of a lot of investment in in the people, a lot of investment in the, in the managers, and a lot of uh, to the previous sessions, but a lot of investment in data as well, so that we can you know we can make sure we're tracking output metrics and not and so that that man the managers have that reassurance. So a real kind of transformation journey over, over a relatively short period, both for, for the organization um, and for the people. And uh, look forward to your questions on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, once again, I'm going to take the first question. Um, there's obvious business benefits, efficiency benefits. but. Most civil service bodies have a, an agenda around diversity as well, and there's obvious potential benefits, especially around being able to increase um, both the hiring and then the promotion of people with caring responsibilities, parents of young children, or have elderly or disabled relatives, or also disabled people who need to come into the office less. Also, uh, as you point out, people outside London and the South East, uh, where you might expect, you know, you're certainly uh, it's a slightly different culture and uh, potentially um, do something around the social mobility angle. Um, so there's those potential benefits. What principles do you need to build into the way you deliver this to make sure you realise those benefits along the way. And I'll start with Martin. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with the benefits that you've um, described there. Um, just to say, I mean, I've just done a, 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 a sort of senior recruitment for, for someone in the smarter working team. And it was really refreshing, or hopefully refreshing for them, but really nice for me when, when I spoke to people about the role. I was saying, no, genuinely, you can be based anywhere. And uh, they told me their circumstances. I said, absolutely. It's about whether, you know, can, it's the outcomes we're going to be looking at uh, rather than anything else. So um, I think you, 
I understand my team and the way that smarter working for me needs to be rolled out and you to understand the benefits is it needs to make sense for each team. So everyone in this room, everyone on the panel works within a team. And um, it, how, what, does, what makes sense for smarter working for you so you get the most out of it and the maximised benefits? So someone earlier, uh, we mentioned user types and that is a really useful way of looking at this. So think about your organisation and the different types of work that you do and then think, right, how are we going to maximise the benefits of this? What are the, oh, it was a brilliant presentation there when we were talking about constraints, because what constraints do we face when we're on this journey, which means we won't, we've got, we've got to be real. You know, what we, I was trying to, not, I don't know if I was trying to be provocative, but I was trying to say, in a few years' time, is there any need for anyone physically to ever be um, um, you know, in the same space together? Because you can. So, obviously, there is a desire for teams to come together on occasions, but what, why really do they need to do so? So, I think the benefits are pretty much limitless, but you've got to think about your team. And if you think about your team and you, you lead it from within the team, then you'll maximize the benefits because it will be about you, not a central team coming in and saying, these are the benefits you could achieve. The team itself needs to say, this is how we're going to take advantage of this. Thanks. I'm actually going for the, for the other UK perspective from the sort of delivery and implementation side. What have you learned about achieving those goals? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of it comes back to what I was saying about culture. That um, you know, you create that kind of that environment and that culture, um, and it it naturally sort of permeates. So you know, we are an organisation now that has you know uh, well above average representation for all the kind of different um, protected characteristics and so on. Um, the other thing I would emphasise, and this I guess particularly applies to the design of services, is um, is real user centricity. So I'll give you one very, uh, very quick and very uh, banal example. So, you know, in keeping with most organisations, we have a, um, a remote access service. Um, that's obviously uh, integral to the ability to work flexibly. Uh, that uh, that remote access service was configured to uh, to time out for reasons of security uh, after four hours. Um, if you're, if you're working at home, you know, minor inconvenience. But if you're working at court, of course, uh, most of our prosecutors get to court about half eight in the morning to start their preparations. The morning court session runs till one o'clock. So actually, that four-hour timeout was right in the middle of the morning court session when you're standing up presenting. And, and that was because the technology team had never spoken to the actual users and that, you know, the classic ivory tower. Um, why is it four hours? Well, because security policy says so. Um, and so, you know, I, I've been at the CPS nearly three years. The, the single most popular thing I have done was change that four hours to ten hours. Um, how did we do that technologically? Well, we found the number four somewhere and we deleted it and typed in ten. It's, you know, there's no, there's no uh, complexity of change there, but it is all about kind of listening to the, to the users and, and actually, um, to your point or to your question, empowering and enabling them to work flexibly in that way. Yeah, I mean, I remember, um, I don't know the overlap really with CPS, but um, Paul Jenkins, who very sadly died uh, a year or so ago, who was head of the government legal service, achieved really, really impressive results in terms of driving up the number of women and of ethnic minorities. Um, and it essentially, that was about uh, serious leadership on just changing working practices and hours that people could work and be flexible. Um, it's come from the top there. Uh, CJ. Uh, you know, I, I agree with both uh, Martin and Mark. I think, uh, I think, like I said, the the base is you know every time we still continue to call this as uh, user and not have the mindset of they are actually your customers when you talk about workspace services. So no one no one taught people how to use Facebook or WhatsApp, right? Because there was a very consumer driven focus on making it easy to use. But when it came to government, when it came to uh, just giving that service to your uh, to your users, somehow we we had IT somehow had a lot of uh, pleasure in what Mark just said, right? Let's just make the policy so that they're dependent on us, right? We'll, we'll stop it every four hours. You need to call someone in IT. So the feeling of power for IT needs to relax. And, and then you need to have a very consumer-driven focus and understand what the user wants. So it's all about designing the service for the user. And, and then end-to-end -end is, is very critical. More often than not, we... We see a lot of times uh, it's, you know, you do 25% of, of the front end very nice or the 25% of the back end. 
But unless it's not an end-to-end -end automated integration uh, driven by AI, a lot of times that service breaks for the customer and, and that, that really results in a bad experience for the users. Thank you. That's, okay. uh, that's right, you said that uh, uh, nobody uh, teaches us how to use uh, Facebook or, or, or whatever, Instagram. Or, uh, these systems which we use, which we develop and, uh, and uh, create, this must be also really, really very simple that because people who are working uh, in, in our control rooms, uh, they are 25 till 75 years old. They must be ready to start to use a new um, IT system, new maps or whatever. And what comes to them um, to be flexible, uh, the working times. It was previously that way that our call takers or people must work uh, 12, uh, 12 hours during the night, 12 hours in days, and then four days uh, they were free. Uh, but actually people, they, 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 they have changes in their lives, something happens and so on. But it was convenient uh, to these uh, people who are working in administration side to make these schedules. Two nights, two nights, two days, two days. And now we have changed it. So uh, because we have single moms, we have elderly people, we have young uh, people who want to work uh, during the night time. So it, it even doesn't matter. Uh, our people can't work at home because all these systems are in our control rooms. But in in, but you have to take in, in, in account that you must be flexible to have to find uh, for this, uh, our people the best working ways that they must be fast, they must be updated, they, they must have the, the easiest uh, IT systems and so on, just to save lives. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'll go to questions in a sec, but actually a word on diversity, because I'm, I'm very aware that the panels we've had today haven't been as diverse as we would like them. This is um, essentially a function of us focusing on getting the right people. We want the, the top people from these different countries, the people running these businesses, and these, that as a demographic is uh, whiter and more male than the, the civil service average. It's un unfortunate that we have to sort of make that choice, especially because I think there's very good evidence that more diverse workforces are more creative, more innovative. That's certainly my experience working in journalism, um, that it, it genuinely brings a business benefit. And I think we would probably see that in government digital service, which has done, uh, has made very rapid progress on women and ethnic minorities. Uh, women have made it up to senior management levels in GDS. Ethnic minorities, not yet. I think they're starting the process, but I very much hope that we will do this again next year and there'll be a, see a bit more progress and diversity on there on the platform. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make that point before asking um, if we had questions from the audience. There's one over there. And there's a microphone heading towards you. Hi, um, it's actually kind of related to what you were just discussing. Um, but I just wondered in terms of smarter working, um, what are we actually doing to measure the impacts um, on productivity um, and you know, what are we seeing in terms of whether those intended benefits are being realised? I think it would make sense to go to Martin again, okay. Maria, if I may. Uh, well, yeah, I, I joined um, uh, Government Property Agency for the home, from the Home Office when I was leading on uh, Smarter Working. So, again, you know, I think coming back to team and organisations like the CPS and the others on the panel, you need the organizations themselves to, to lead this. And so um, in the Home Office, we, we, we really thought through what are the implications of allowing people uh, choice and, and flexibility. And, um, and, and we did time and motion studies and built quite a complex uh, productivity benefits model, included that in our business case, and that was able to justify a huge investment in uh, laptops for all our staff. Um, so yeah, it's quite hard graft, I would suggest, because if anyone's worked on a business case, it's about the structure and the rigor that you need uh, for that to justify the investment. Uh, within government, uh, we've been to some private sector firms where I think you know, it sometimes can be a different approach, but I've not seen within government where you can get approval for the investment if you haven't done the rigorous work and the rigorous models around uh, productivity. Um, so you do that. Um, I think the 
the leap of faith, I suppose, is to apply that to budgets uh, within the organisation. And sometimes uh, organisations choose to take it as a non-cashable benefit and allow the productivity benefits to flow. But um, I've, we've done the time of motion that shows when I was in the Home Office, but examples across government where it saves. But yes, as was pointed out earlier, often the benefits from smarter working are through the estate's savings because they're tangible and they're real, you need less space. And then you get into quite tangled as soon as you talk about productivity benefits because people say, I'm already working seven hours and 24 minutes a day, uh, which is in the UK civil service, how long you have to work every day. I'm already working more than that. So if I'm more productive, how can I save money? So it can be, but every organization is different. Um, and uh, the productivity benefits, we, we would say, are at least 10%. But you, know, you need to be realistic and it, you need to probably model for lower than that. Kathleen, have you been able to see measure benefits either in efficiency or productivity or um, morale staff engagement? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yes. Um, um. We, we, we measure uh, we measure lo lots of things lots of uh, uh, for example how fast we handle the call how fast we can send out uh, the resources um, it was six seven years ago when police and rescue and ambulance they had their own control rooms and and this was uh, that way that you called 112 and then they decided that then they sent this call to police and so on it's um, I can't say the numbers, but but I know that this this is this is a second or minutes with what we already with what we uh, we can be faster. We can send out the resources faster, and and now we are um, uh, using EI. Uh, we want to use. We are just uh, uh, have some plans uh, and, and testing. And so during this time, when our call taker is um, uh, adding all the information, uh, the uh, machine is understanding what is written. And uh, right now, it's that way that the dispatcher is uh, saying to the um, to, uh, through the radio to um, um, ambulance and uh, rescue uh, um, buildings. And it takes 20 seconds that uh, she reads and she understands and then she takes uh, um, radio and uh, gives this uh, command to drive out. But uh, if uh, the machine uh, uh, will uh, read and understand what is written and give this uh, information directly to this, uh, um, this uh, uh, rescue teams or, or ambulance teams, we save uh, 20 seconds. So uh, uh, the, 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 what we are, um, what, what is the effic efficiency we, 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 we are we, we're looking for is the seconds because if the, there is, if you're having a heart attack or, or, or some big accident had happened, then the seconds are counting. So we, um, and of course this uh, e-call systems when car calls to, to, to our uh, centers, so. Uh, was the right answer. Yeah, that's right. There's, there's a lot of people's lives over time. Yes, yes. yes. This, this, this is what we are measuring, actually. This is to save the lives. If we save one life, then we are really successful. And we, we do it uh, all the time. Or, or people are giving birth in, in cars. If you would uh, have uh, the video call, you can assist better. For example, the becoming father, how you should do or what you should do. So uh, we really hope that uh, this video call will, will also help to, to assist or, or help people more. Yeah, that's a very concrete set of benefits, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, Sujay. Um, yeah. I'm, you know, with um, that, that, there are certain ways to measure the exact benefits for the workspace services, but but it, it permeates broader than that. Uh, so, for example, we've seen organisations that have uh, implemented the workspace services well and and deliver some of the benefits we've been speaking. The attrition rate has actually come down quite drastically, and and the reason for that is uh, the study says that people typically tend to leave organisations when their first one week or two week of experience in that organisation. Is, is not a pleasant one. And that's mostly because you've not designed it to the right services. Uh, so that's immeasurable. The other measurable is the availability of the services itself, uh, right? So uh, again, every time you have a system that's down uh, for one person, 
A study shows that there are about five people that are affected because that one person is down and he cannot perform his function. So it's, it's a big multiplicative uh, uh, problem that goes on, right? So one person down affects five other people and that just keeps uh, moving more and more. So therefore, measuring that availability today uh, and, and with the uh, maturity of the AI ops or even services, you know, we, we for example, uh, you know, the, uh, Mark, you can talk about things like, you know, the digital locker stuff that we do today uh, to just make it very consumerized for people has reduced the downtime of people quite drastically, right? Uh, they really, really don't have to travel long distances for IT support. Uh, think of think of another metric in terms of the education, right? Uh, there, there are a lot of places across the board wherein you would not be able to get that quality education sitting from your home if you didn't have the right level of uh, you know system virtualization, which would remove the dependency of any sort of physical uh, proximity, and and you convert that into a, a benefit. Uh, it's a huge benefit because that then allows someone to get an education without the need for traveling two hours and perhaps would not be able to do that. Uh, so, so there are really, really tangible benefits today if you design the workspace uh, services. Uh, but again, as long as you, you're tying it back to the, to the user and their needs, then, then that's the way to measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> Mark, I suppose I'd link it to Kathleen's answer, actually. I mean, you talked a bit about uh, cash savings, et cetera. Um, is there any evidence around you know, the quality of decision-making going on, the speed with which uh, cases are processed, et cetera? So, I mean, obviously those things are, those things are very hard to... They're, 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 they're not hard to measure, but they're very hard to uh, measure how the fluctuations are based on individual initiatives. So. You know, we, we absolutely monitor kind of speed with which cases go through the criminal justice system, for instance. Um, you know, uh, an example of an initiative we've done to enable flexible working is replacing physical disks for transfer of kind of multimedia evidence with digital portals. Now, we know that it used to take, you know, somebody some time to burn to a disk and then a courier to move it from the police to ourselves or ourselves um, and then somebody to unencrypt at the other end and so on. And now you can just upload it and then it's, or download it and then it's there. So that absolutely has sped up the process faster than it would have been. Um, if you look at the headline metric for how long does a case go, you know, take to get from inception to, to the very end, you know, there's, there's too much other collateral noise in the data um, because you know, the, the law is changing, the processes are changing, different uh, parts of the system are over or under resourced. So, so hard to tie it kind of that level, but equally not hard to, to identify a business case saving associated with, with the specifics of, um, you know, of, of um, disk-free transfer or indeed with, uh, as was just mentioned, with lockers that enable a, a prosecutor who, would, who wants to go to court to go and get a replacement device that's pre-built that's already ready for them as opposed to having to wait for three days for it to come in the mail. We're like, it, intuitively, it, it's, a, it's a huge efficiency saving, um, but hard to kind of tie to the, to the mega macro metrics because there's, there's too many other influencing factors. There certainly is in the court system at the moment. There's no thunder, isn't it? Um, oh, Hans, there's a gentleman down here. Um, hello, uh, Jerry Kelly from the translation service of the European Commission in Brussels. Uh, thanks very much for the presentations, uh, extremely interesting. Um, quite impressed with the CPS uh, going from uh, over 200 million pages, that leaves us in the halfpenny place anyway. Um, I, I just wonder, particularly on the practical implementations of how far you've come, both in particular, the you know the CPS service and the Estonian rescue service. Their real-world cases you've given. Um, it's getting quite late in the day. So this morning, I would have asked you for the ten key things that enable this to happen. But at this point, maybe if you could just highlight, you know, one or two. You know, what was the real eureka or light bulb moments? which helped you on the very uh, stimulating journey that you've just helped us with, or uh, that you've just discussed with us. Thank you. 
It's great, yeah. That's kind of a single key lesson or learning from your experience. We'll start at the other end now. Go, Mark. Uh, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, I need to give you one or two, not ten. Um, but uh, I, I think if I was going to pinpoint one thing, it is leadership that totally buys into that change. You know, the, the change from... Uh, I'm not going to lie, the change from a paper-based workflow to a digital-based workflow was hard uh, and was particularly hard for lots of people who weren't, you know, who weren't naturally accustomed to working in that way. So you need kind of, uh, you know, and that refers to both people within the CPS over whom we have, you know, kind of a, a degree of, uh, of control, if you like, but also people in the wider criminal justice system who, who we don't. Um, and so actually that kind of, that real leadership and commitment to, to driving it through um, and demonstrating the benefits to all parties um, that this could bring was, I think, the you know, if, if you ask me for one key ingredient, you, if, if you don't have that commitment to, to make this kind of scale of transformation, I, I don't think you'd get there. I think nobody's going to argue with that. Well, he's taking the best now, isn't he? But I'm still <laughs> going to ask you, Jay, for the second one. Um. So, so the number one reason, actually, Mark mentioned. So, it's 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 the buy-in uh, for the change, but but also the second second thing is the the communication of that change, right? Uh, so, so a lot of times, uh, you know, there are the really really good changes that we can make to the IT system or or to the workplace system, but communicating that to the users in a language that they understand is going to be very very key. Uh, it, we we tend to uh, you know measure our benefits. Uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of IT metrics or in terms of numbers, but that's not how users tend to use that service. Uh, so, the, so, so wherever this has really, really succeeded is where organizations or, or the change, uh, people who are owning up the change have communicated the benefits of that to the user, uh, benefits of that in terms of what they would benefit on their daily work uh, is, has, has really, really been a big change, right? So you, you need to tell the users what is it for them to, to play along with this change? And, and once you convince them, uh, you will see changes is not that difficult to accept. Mm, thank you. Uh, I would say that uh, you, can't forget, uh, uh, you can't forget just these call takers, these workers. If we use all this new technology, all this uh, GIS, 112 maps, uh, AML, uh, video calls, so on, this is uh, actually this is easy to, to, to create new IT systems and so on. But as I already said, we have people aged 25 to 75, and you can't uh, forget that them just in the, in, in the first of the phase already, uh, they must be um, involved, they, they must be testing all the time because when uh, you can't go that way, that here is the program, so uh, now we are ready since of the 1st of January to take, uh, receive these video calls and our workers say, oh, oh my god, uh, this is not makes me faster or quicker to send out the help, but uh, this is so, so difficult, so we can't uh, forget the people, as you said who is going to use this technology uh, and, uh, and this must be easy and they must be, evolved, uh, in, um, must be part of this process and must be updated, learned, teached and um, yes, technology is great but we can't forget uh, people who's going to use this. Thank you. Um, yeah, so probably it's probably building on those answers. I, I couldn't agree more with them. So, yeah, I, I would say the practical thing that I thought was the, the biggest thing in the organisations where I've rolled out smarter working is the change network so that you do have a structured uh, change network that you obviously have got advocates, but you actually have something that's structured from the very top of the organisation through to sponsors and uh, advocates within teams so that they really make sense of it for themselves. So um, that structure around a change network would be my number one if other number ones have already been taken. We only, I mean, that's the clock slightly misleading. I think we've only got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask just one more question and ask for very short answers. Is it possible to use this 
agenda around workspace change to itself foster innovation, to create either physical spaces that foster it or encourage collaboration or communications platforms or to uh, create a space which in itself fosters a more innovative workforce. Who fancies that one? Oh. Can I call it physical, physical space? Well, I could be talking about you know, spaces where you, know, you put all your teams together in a building and there's plenty of spaces where they can meet and get to know each other, or you know, some, like, there's this thing on top of the treasury which is about... Well, any, a, I would say anyone, you know, I've, I've talked about the different areas this morning, but anyone that's worked in a, in a building that's uh, modern with breakout space, different areas to work as a team, and then has to, or is for a short period, hopefully, working in a, a more traditional what probably isn't a traditional office now, but an old-fashioned office where there isn't breakout space, it it's blows your mind because you're not able to break out and collaborate in the way that you used to physically. Um, you can still obviously collaborate um, with technology, but physical collaboration has completely changed since I started work. So absolutely, you need alternative workspaces in, in modern workspace. Otherwise, people just, they, they can't function. Um, I can't function. I came from that period, but I... Can, I I have recently worked in a space with no breakout areas, and I just couldn't, I couldn't, it affected the whole way that I approached my work. So mm. I, I think it's vital that where people do come together physically, that there are spaces where they can collaborate in different ways. And Sujay, do you see that? If you go into a, a, a client organization, you see how they work yeah. beforehand, they change. Is it in itself a way of creating a more innovative workforce? And no, absolutely. Um, you know, if you, if you, if you see the name itself, it's, it's no longer workplace, but workspace. So therefore, it actually transcends outside the boundaries of just the device itself. Uh, you know, and, and, and I agree with uh, Martin. You know, if all the places that we've seen customers, uh, you know, design the right workspace, so therefore the right places where people can meet, sit, discuss, uh, and transcends across the device has, has, has a huge impact. And, and people, once they've got used to that new, modern, open workspaces to work for, uh, they would absolutely feel claustrophobic going into the age-old conference rooms and, and trying to come up with a good idea. So, uh, so, so workplace is, is, has transcended across the physical space also in terms of being more collaborative and being, being just more easy in terms of talking to people. So yeah, it, it has transcended. Kathleen, you uh, our people are, um, are working in this big control room. Uh, there are maybe 20, 25 persons in the same time in the room. And this must be this way because uh, the dispatchers help and uh, uh, the call takers so on. But what is our challenge? We must um, uh, create, uh, let's say, resting room, uh, silent rooms, rooms where they can have a massage when they can maybe two of them just have a chat or, or so. It's uh, our challenge is to make uh, um, some, such kind of rooms they can, or spaces they can chill during the working time because uh, uh, they must have 10-15 minutes break in every hour and then they should uh, enjoy it somewhere. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, but I think the same point applies to uh, applies to bringing people new tools as well as to the physical spaces. So it is, it is kind of, you know, work environment in its broadest sense. So, you know, hu humans are an extremely resourceful species um, and people at work are particularly good at finding whatever the path of least resistance is. Um, and so I think actually, you know, you give people these tools and they find creative ways to, to make the most use of them. Um, and that, that's, you know, that can present a risk to make sure that you've kind of still got the you know the right uh, the right processes, the right controls, the right whatever. But actually, it's also a huge opportunity to um, to kind of harness that innovation by um, by letting it kind of naturally foster. Thank you.